friends, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, and tonight we are going to read a very little sutta. It's going to be, it's called the Samadhi Sutta. So we're going to be talking about Samadhi tonight. So that'll be an aspect of tonight. But we're actually going to be talking about a lot of things tonight. This is I'll tell you why I chose this sutra. So the sutra we're doing tonight, by the way, we are still in the connected discourses. So the Samyutta Nikaya, we are still in the section concerning the skandhas, the aggregates. And tonight we're going to do, this is the fifth sutta in the collection of suttas about the skandhas and this the fifth one here if you happen to have the the big book it's on page 863 otherwise we've given you a link to the uh, version on sutta central so this is the sutra and by the way also we're going to also take a quick peek at sutra number six in this section i'll mention all of that in a second but let me kind of give you a quick, like, why did I choose this sutra tonight? I chose this sutra because I, if you've been coming lately, so if you've been watching the videos or you've been coming on Sunday nights, weeks ago, we were reading from a different section of the Samyutta Nikaya. We were reading a really small section that it was a collection of poems by these enlightened Buddhist nuns. And you'll remember we spent, I think, about maybe three nights on the 10, <clears throat> the 10 poems in that section. And that was a really beautiful uh, section, a beautiful grouping of little suttas. And if you remember, those suttas were all about these nuns, these um, uh, el elder nuns, these theris, and they were arahats, enlightened women. It was about them going off into the woods to meditate alone and then being confronted by Mara, the devil, the evil one, and sort of being, well, frightened or cajoled or prodded, but sort of tempted in various ways of giving up the pursuit, of leaving the seclusion of the forest. And what we heard from all of the nuns was their, the, a poem about what gave them such strength, what gave them such courage, what gave them such ability to stare death in the face and say, no, thank you. Well, you'll remember that each of them, it all kind of came down to cutting off or putting an end to the skandhas, the self, that it was by not having this attachment to that sense of self that they were liberated from all of those, that fear and all of that. That is what then segued us to talk about the section on the skandhas. Because if these 10 enlightened women were liberated by their understanding of the skandhas, well, then we should understand the skandhas. So that's why I shifted to that section of the Samyutta Nikaya. And then we started with a sutta called, uh, I think it was the one called the burden. And it was about putting down the burden. What is the burden, bhikshus? the five aggregates, putting down the burden. Then I did a sutra after that about uh, the cause of anxiety, the uh, anxiety from grasping, but it was specifically, that sutra was specifically about grasping or clinging at the five aggregates. And that when the aggregates change, it causes anxiety because we're clinging to them as they were, not kind of accepting them as they are in that way. And then last week, 
we did the uh, Haladakani Sutta, which was another discourse about the five aggregates. But this time it was about the aggregates as potentially being the home of consciousness versus a consciousness that was homeless, not taking up residence, not abiding in the aggregates. So from all of that, we then now know, we have been told, we have been taught, there's a there's something going on here with the aggregates and a kind of letting go of those aggregates. How do we do that? What, what is it to do that? <laughs> Tonight is now the answer to that question. Now that we know the problem, how do we solve the problem? So that's why I chose this particular sutta tonight. Um, even before we kind of dive into this particular sutta. So, and I, I will have a few words to say about the title, of course, but I just want you to know that the fifth sutra in this collection is the one that we're going to read. It's the Samadhi Sutta. And the next sutra is called the Sutra on Seclusion. And it is basically exactly the same sutra, except it has a slightly different introduction. So sutra number six, the Buddha talks, he's at Savati, Shravasti, and he says, bhikshus, uh, practitioners, let's say, make an exertion Make effort in seclusion. A bhikshu, a bhikkhu, who is secluded, understands things as they really are. And what does it mean to understand things as they really are? And then this actually turns into the sutra that we're going to read tonight. So I just want you to know that there is this other sutra that talks about going off to seclusion to do what we're going to talk about tonight. So let's kind of keep that in mind, that everything that we're going to talk about tonight, there's another sutra that tells us that all of this should probably be done alone in seclusion. Okay. Let's go back to sutra number five now. So sutra number five, again, the titles of these sutras, you know, take these titles um, with a grain of salt because all of these titles were given afterwards in a way. So it is called the Samadhi Sutta, but let's just read this. So, thus have I heard, at Savati, at Shravasti, there the Blessed One said this, Bhikshus, bhikkhus, develop samadhi, develop concentration. A bhikkhu who is concentrated, who is in samadhi, understands things as they really are. And what does one understand as it really is? the origin and passing away of form, the origin and passing away of sensations or feelings, the origin and passing away of perception, the origin and passing away of volitional formations, which we know is conditioning or samskara, and the origin and passing away of consciousness, so that's the beginning of the sutta. Right, even just that, we have a lot of ideas to unpack. There's so much going on here. So let's begin. So thus have I heard. We got no problems with that. Shravasti, Savati, Savati. We have no problem with that. That's a place. And there, the Buddha, the Blessed One, the Bhagavad, said, develop 
samadhi. Now, if we look at the, the Pali, the original Pali, it's bah, bahava, bahavate, or bahavata. And there's this word bah, bahava, and it is one of the most basic words in Buddhism for meditation. It literally, as I understand it, it literally means like work, <laughs> like work on it. So that's where you get this idea of develop, work on, cultivate. Cultivate might be another uh, good translation for bhava or this idea of uh, bhavata. So develop samadhi. So I've done a whole, I've done several Dharma doors just talking about the idea of samadhi. I, so we don't want to go over all of that. Let me just remind you. The word samadhi, it is usually translated as, as it is here as concentration. It is a meditative state of mind. You could call it a meditative state of mind. It is a type of meditation. But, and by the way, of course, I always kind of like to say this. I have learned that every teacher of Buddhism defines samadhi a different way. It's almost like everybody has their own understanding of what it of what that means. So my understanding of what this idea of samadhi means, well, first of all, I always go to the language, I go to the word. You may know already that the word samadhi, samadhi is a compound, it's a word with two parts and sama, which by the way this prefix Sama, it's going to come up a few times tonight. So Sama is where we get the English word same from. Sama means the same. Sama D, the word D-H-I is a, a form of the root word dir, which is where you get the word Dharma from. By the way, this word dar or dur, it's where we get the English word endure, endurance, enduring, perduring. All those words that have dur, like endurance, that root, uh, the root of those words is the same as the root dharma, dur, and it's the root of samadhi. But what samadhi means is to kind of hold together or to hold as the same. And that idea right there, to hold as the same, that actually kind of captures what samadhis are like or what they are experienced like, which is Samadhis are almost always defined as a state of oneness, a feeling of unity or oneness, not duality, not subject object, not me and it, but just happening. <laughs> no me, no it, happening. And so when there has been a kind of a collapse of subject and object, they are being, the subject and the object are being held as the same. And that's samadhi. So it's a meditative state that's brought about by this kind of collapsing of that sense of self and object. So the Buddha tells us, Cult cultivate that. Cultivate samadhi. But what does that mean, Buddha? And like all great sutras, the Buddha has an answer for us. So, develop samadhi. One, or a practitioner who is in samadhi or who is, who is concentrated, understands things as they really are. So 
this is a, also a complicated idea to understand things as they really are. Now, we need to be really careful about this idea of things as they really are. And I say this as a kind of amateur philosopher in that sense. And what I mean is, in the Western philosophical world, in particular Western metaphysics, there is this kind of idea of trying to get to things in and of themselves. The idea to, of getting to like the real thing, not, not what I'm projecting or overlayering onto reality, but like reality as it quote really is. Western philosophy, going all the way back to Plato, but this really picked up steam, like with Immanuel Kant in particular, and it was about this pursuit for the real. And the thing about it is, is that when in Buddhist texts, when they translate ideas and they, they translated like understanding things as they really are, that can sound a lot like the Western philosophical pursuit. But I got to tell you that it's not, at least from my understanding, it's not what's being expressed in the sutras or in especially in this sutra. It's not about seeing things as they really are. So the complicated phrase is this idea of, let's see, in the, in this, in the Pali here, it's yatha bhuttam prajanati. Now those ideas, and that's Pali. In Sanskrit, this would be something more like bhutta tathata pranya. So the Sanskrit idea of bhutta tathata, or this yata bhutam in Pali. It's not about things as they really are. It's not exactly that idea. It's the idea of things as such, as so. And things as such, or things as seeing things as they are, not as they really are, although the idea of Buddha, and by the way, I'm not saying Buddha, I'm saying B-H-U-T-A, Bahutta. Bahutta means like the truth. So it is about seeing the truth, but it's the truth of things as they are. Not so much the truth of things as they really are. And I know this is all getting probably a little too subtle so early in the night. So let's kind of back up. We are told by the Buddha that uh, someone who is in samadhi, samahito bhikave, so some one who is in samadhi, quote, sees things as they really are. Now, the other part of that idea is in, in the Pali is this pajanati which is this idea of prajna, this transcendent wisdom. So one who is in samadhi, we are told, has the transcendent prajna wisdom of things as they are. <laughs> the, the transcendent wisdom of the truth of the way things are. That might kind of be a way of thinking about this. But the Buddha's done that thing where he said, okay, everybody practice samadhi. And then it's like, well, but what, what does that mean, Buddha? And he's like, oh, well, what it means is to clearly see things as they really are. <laughs> okay. How do I see things as they really are? But don't worry. That's exactly what the Buddha has come to, to tell us. So 
Follow the logic here. Cultivate samadhi. What's samadhi? Well, see things as they really are. What does it mean to see things as they really are? And what does one understand as it really is? The origin and passing away of the skandhas. The origin and passing away of form, sensation, perception, conditioning, and consciousness. And then, of course, we're going to have the question, what's the origin of form? <laughs> and, of course, that's the next section of the sutra. But let's talk language. So there's a really important word. In fact, even though tonight is ostensibly about samadhi and about the samadhi sutta, tonight is really about samudya. And this one I did write down. So this is about samudya, what's being translated as arising. And then atahangaamma, atahangaamma, something like that, is setting down. So those are the two terms that we're working with here. And I want to focus in particular on the, the samudya. So... What is it to understand things as they really are? It's understanding the samudya of form and understanding this atahangama, atahangama, this dissolution of form. So very, very important word. Samudya. Here's the thing about it. What you need to know, or, or you need to remember, because you probably already know this, Samudya is the second noble truth. Samudya is what is called the arising. But I got to tell you, I've learned, I learned something a, a, a number of years ago, long, actually a long time ago, and learning this completely changed my understanding of the Four Noble Truths. So you know the Four Noble Truths, right? The first Noble Truth is the Noble Truth of suffering. There is suffering. The second Noble Truth is usually spoken of as the origin of suffering the samudya of suffering. So now we have this text calling samudya arising, but normally samudya is translated as origin. But what's interesting, and I didn't write this down, but the word samudya it, it's a complicated word. I was really doing a lot of research into this word. There's our prefix, by the way, sam, the same prefix. We we're talking about the samadhi means the same. But then there's udaya. And udaya does apparently mean a kind of arising. But it's a, a specific kind of arising, a specific kind of origin. And what it is, is that more so than arising, and oh, and I'll, I'll tell you how I le learned this. So there's this Chinese character. It's pronounced G, G. And this is the way the Chinese translate samudaya or samudya. The thing about it, though, is, is that G, this character, which if you don't know Chinese or what's interesting about Chinese, so this is the character for bird. This is the character for tree. A bird in a tree, and actually this should be birds, plural, birds in a tree. The word G 
means to gather together like a flock of birds in a tree. This is the way the Chinese, and now I've destroyed the character, sorry about that. This is the way the Chinese translate samudya. And the thing about it is, is if you go deeper into the Sanskrit or the Pali, samudya, yes, it kind of is about a, a coming about, but it's not an arising. It's more like, it's more like, so hold off on all that. You know, we have the English word accrual. If something accrues, it, it, it like build, it's like builds up. And what I want you to think about is that when something is accruing, when something is building up, it's arising. <laughs> it's like coming into existence. It is originating. It's, it's, it's <laughs> arising, but it's a particular kind of arising, which is an arising from a kind of gathering together. And that's a, a, a very kind of certain vibe. That has a certain thing to it. And what I mean is, is that there's another word like udgata. Udgata means to like be born, to like appear, to arise. And there's a way in which when something is born, it sort of just sort of like pops up. <laughs> like I'm here, but samudya is this kind of accruing. When I first realized that the Chinese understood samudya as G, as accruing, all of a sudden the Four Noble Truths made so much more sense to me because it was about suffering and the accumulation of suffering, not the origin of suffering, not like where it comes from, but the second noble truth is about the accruing of suffering, that it's like building and building and building. Now, where's that accruing coming from? As the third noble truth tells us, it's coming from craving, from tanha. But it's not exactly that tanha, I mean, tanha, craving is the origin of suffering, but I think it's really helpful to know that the second noble truth is about this accrual or this forming of suffering. And that is what we're talking about. But tonight, we're not talking about it in terms of suffering. We're talking about it in terms of the aggregate of form, then sensations, perception, conditioning, and consciousness. So we're talking about the accrual of form, the accrual or the gathering or accumulating of sensations, the accumulating of perceptions, the accumulating of samskaric conditioning, and the accumulating of consciousness. So now the reason why I think that, that that's a better way to understand samudya is because if we look at the opposite of it, this word that I really can't pronounce very well at all, these, this atangama, the root of that word is anga. Anga, as in ashtanga, the eight limbs, or as in bodhyanga, the limbs of awakening, the limbs of enlightenment. Angas are, are limbs. You could also think of like a tree. There's another word or an idea for an anga, which is like a, a member, a branch, a member. So the word athangama, which literally kind of means a setting down, but it kind of seems to imply a kind of dismemberment, this kind of falling apart of the limbs. It's, it's coming apart at the seams. That's this idea of, of the, the, well, it's the idea of what's being translated 
as the passing away of form. But you can also think of it as like this dissolution or something like that. Okay. So cultivate samadhi. <laughs> what does that mean? It means to see things as they really are. What does it mean to see things as they really are? Well, it's to see the arising and passing away of form. It's to see the arising or accumulating of sensations and the passing away of sensations and so on and so forth through all five aggregates. So at this point, we have our question. What does that mean? The arising or accumulating of form. And what bhikkhus is the origin of form? What is the origin of sensation or feeling? What is the origin of perception? What is the origin of volitional formations or conditioning? What is the origin and passing away of consciousness? What is the origin of consciousness? Here, bhikkhus, one seeks delight, one welcomes, one remains holding. And what is it that one seeks delight in? That What is it that one welcomes? What is it that one remains holding? One seeks delight in form welcomes it and remains holding it. As a consequence, delight arises. Delight in form is upadana, is clinging. With one's clinging as the condition, Bhava, existence, comes to be. With existence as condition, birth. With birth as condition, aging and death. And with aging and death as a condition, sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure, and despair come to be. Such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. All right, and then, well, let me just finish this. So also one seeks delight in sensations, welcomes sensations, and then what's the language? And remains holding to sensations. One delights in perception, welcomes perception, remains holding perception. One delights in conditioning, welcomes conditioning, remains holding conditioning. And one delights in, sorry, in consciousness, welcomes it and remains holding to it. As a consequence of this, delight arises. And then from delight with delight, in form is clinging. With one's clinging as a condition, existence comes to be. With existence as condition, birth. With birth as a condition, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, displeasure, and despair. Such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. This bhikkhus is the origin of form. This is the origin of sensation, the origin of perception, the origin of, of conditioning, the origin of consciousness. And then we'll do the passing away of that. But hold on one second. We need to notice something. And, and actually, I need to like, I should have done this a moment ago, but I want to remind everybody of something really quickly. So the reason why I wanted to spend, you know, so many nights on the five aggregates is because it's such an important idea. It's so important to Buddhism. 
I want to remind you that from nights before, we've already spoken about how the five aggregates is what replaces the idea of the self in Buddhism, right? So we have this idea that there's just, quote, me, like me. But the teachings of Buddhism are about how actually this is an aggregation or an amalgamation of these five aggregates, which is to say the body of physical form. That's the first aggregate, the body of physical form. So that's the first thing that this is, is it's this body, not that body, not quote your body, but this body. But like I'm always saying, this body is constantly changing. I'm losing hairs, cells are dying. You know, so this body of form is constantly changing. So there's that, the physical body of form that's constantly changing. But wait, there's more. <laughs> there are the sensations that, that are being experienced right now that you are experiencing, but you aren't experiencing them. There's a body of form with sensations firing off that are different at every moment, different. You're not, quote, you are not perceiving the same thing you were perceiving an hour ago. An hour ago, you were perceiving an entirely different thing, and now you're perceiving probably this. But there's that perception that's happening right here, right now, that's always changing. And then there's the state of being conditioned that all of this matter, the eyes, the ears, the nose, all of it's conditioned and constantly being conditioned. So it's a never ending process of conditioning. And then there's a current present state of conscious awareness that's here now that has already changed from when I started talking about the aggregates. The point is, is that there's this, meaning at any given moment, there's this configuration of skandhas. Oh wait, this configuration of skandhas. Oh wait, this configuration of skandhas. So that's the aggregates versus the self. The self is singular, the aggregates are multiple. The self doesn't change. And this is the main delusion about the self. There's this idea that there's just me all the time. That never changes. It, it experiences things, but the me, the delusion that we have is that I have been me my whole life. That's the me that the Buddha said, no, here's your aggregates. You, this, actually this right here is an ever-changing, ever-morphing aggregation of these five skandhas. So we've already dealt with no self. Rather, there's these aggregates right here, right now. So, we're trying to see as they really are, or we're trying to see as it really is, the arising or the origin or the accumulation, the samudya, of form. And what we've been told here, so you might think the origin of form. Well, if rupa, form, is the physical body, if you heard about the origin of form, you might start thinking about molecular biology. You might start thinking about, oh, you mean where did the physical elements of this body come from? Well, and then you could get 
get into your molecular biology to understand where the physical body came from. What I want you to notice, though, is that the Buddha tells us, no, no, no. What's the origin of form? Where does form rupa come from or what's its origin? Well, it goes like this. One seeks delight. <laughs> one welcomes. One remains holding. And what is it that one seeks delight in? What does one welcome? To what does one remain holding? One seeks delight in form, welcomes it, and remains holding it. As a consequence of this, delight arises. Delight in form is clinging. With one's clinging as a condition, existence comes to be. With existence as a condition, birth, with birth as a condition, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure, and despair come to be. This is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. I want you to notice that there was a lot of psychology involved in that, not a lot of molecular biology. A lot of psychology about desiring, delighting in, clinging to, all of those ideas. So let's focus really clearly on that, that the Buddha is not talking about where does the body of form come from in that sense. It's more about, well, it's more about this idea of clinging to the body of form. In particular, the sutra is telling us about seeking delight in form. And since I, I've realized now that time has gotten, you know, as always with Dharma doors, time's gotten away. So let's start talking about all five aggregates, not just the form one. So it's about seeking delight in sensations, welcoming delight in sensations, and then clinging to that, clinging to those sensations. It's about seeking delight in perception, welcoming it, and clinging to that perception. It's about seeking delight in conditions or conditioning, welcoming it, clinging to it, seeking delight in consciousness. Now, I want to go back to something I mentioned at the very, very beginning of tonight, which is that in the, in the sutra after this, the Buddha talks about going into seclusion to, to do this. And I kind of want to remind you that the basic... The basic project, as I would call it, the basic project of early Buddhism was to overcome addiction to sensory stimuli. We are sensory junkies. We need to be looking at something. We need to be listening to something. We need to be smelling something. We need to be eating something. We need to be thinking about something. We need to be touched. We need to be touching. And if you start taking those things away from us and put us in seclusion and telling us to shut our eyes, close the ears, be in silence, then the idea is, is that our addictive personality, like we are so addicted to sensory stimuli that if you were to put us in a quiet room, the idea is, is that we would either not want to be there, meaning because we want the stimuli, or we would just get bored. But boredom is a sign of that kind of addiction to stimuli. If you're if you're ever bored, it's be, it's that idea of like, 
I need stimuli of some sort. I can't really just be happy being. <laughs> what a crazy idea, right? Like just being happy being. No, no, no. I need to be experiencing something. So part of the Buddhist project is about removing yourself from sensory stimulation and getting kind of comfortable not being stimulated, being comfortable not with visible forms, being comfortable in silence, being comfortable without smells and flavors and all of that, ultimately being comfortable not kind of being in your body. And I mean that in either in any way, you kind of transcendent experiences or just sort of a detachment from the body. But the point is, is that all of this is sort of the way, at least in early Buddhism, this is the way to enlightenment. This is the path to the ending of suffering. So we want to kind of think about these ideas about what's called nandi. Nandi is delight. It's related to the word uh, nanda, which is related to the word ananda or in the, and the name ananda. So the, all these words for delighting, pleasure, happiness, and this idea that the Buddha talks about in terms of seeking nandi, seeking delight in form, sensations, perception, conditioning, and consciousness. If you have studied with me before, or you've been coming to Dharma doors, the way that I talk about this, the, the way I talk about this very idea is I call it outsourcing our joy. And by outsourcing, I mean, we put our joy in things, meaning like, oh, no, 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 that makes me happy. That makes me happy. That, that. And so there is this kind of outsourcing of happiness to things. And then we get in this mind state, which is that, well, it kind of goes like this. First of all, it's, oh, that thing makes me happy. Then that eventually becomes, I need, I need that thing in order to be happy. You get to a point where you can no longer be happy without that thing. Now you're, you're in a compromised position because your joy and your happiness in this life of yours is dependent upon is contingent upon something. And the idea is, is that only works as long as you can get your stuff, as long as you can get your thing. But as soon as you don't have access to your thing, as soon as you don't have access to your stuff, suffering, agitation, the suffering is coming from not being able to get your stuff but you have conditioned yourself, or I should say the aggregates have been conditioned to need that stuff. So once again, the value of meditation, the value of seclusion, the value of sensory deprivation. You know, last time I checked, sensory deprivation tanks like the saltwater tanks that you float in and to achieve a state of sensory deprivation. People like sensory deprivation. And we like it because that's a, a, a better way to be happy because you're being joyful and happy from not needing anything. Now, of course, as a preliminary, you will need your sensory deprivation tank but we will eventually have to let go of even our sensory deprivation tank, of course. So, all right, questions, comments, or ideas about the origin of the aggregates. 
Yeah, Noe. Uh, wow, great stuff. Um, delight, I, I like that. Hmm. I think it just comes to mind as that idea of knowing, you know, knowing. Uh, uh, the 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 boot that like like embrace it like know it and then let go of it. Mm -hmm. If I don't if I push it away, I don't want it anymore. I don't want this anymore. I'm sitting in meditation, going, "Go away, thought, thought. go mm -hmm. away, thought. No, don't think about that enchilada that I had for dinner. <laughs> I had a wonderful enchilada for dinner. I delighted in the enchilada for dinner, and now I can let it go, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Something like. Duca is Duca. Yeah. That's all. <clears throat> now, I, Noe, in, in response to what Noe just said, I want to remind everybody that the language here about seeking delight in is the key. Because again, Noe, to just be enjoying a meal is not exactly what we're talking about here. We're talking about that idea of like, I'm not happy now, but I will be happy when I get my enchilada. And then that's the seeking delight in the enchilada. Seeking it. Not actually having it in there, but the, the thinking or the seeking. So let's pay attention to that. By the way, I have, oh, please, Maria, please, please, please. Um, I just wanted to add that I hear so much of myself in this piece about being a sensory junkie. Um, I rarely watch TV anymore, but I used to like be that person who had like TV in every room. And now I saw it come up one day I was looking through Dharma talks and I like kind of always had to have, a, it was like replace the TV thing. Um, some kind of media, podcast, book, something going on. Um, but I was looking through my Dharma talks and it was like played, 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 <laughs> played, played. And I thought, well, maybe I should look at this. <laughs> um, and I thought about the fact that I hadn't done a lot of unguided meditation. And what was that about? You know, like, was hmm. I, tr was I sort of, aversive to that seclusion and to that sensory um, deprivation and to sort of that concentration. Um, so um, trying to sort of push my practice in that direction now. And I find now that that's a refuge. I, you know, I sit down and I kind of want to automatically go back to the guided meditation and I'm like no i'm 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 leaning into the stillness uh, a lot more so thank you for that comment wonderful yeah and and you know obviously we just want to notice these things there's no self flagellation there's no you know bad meditator it's just about recognizing like it sounds like you did sort of recognizing and then leaning into that a little pushing in that spot a little bit and i would then yeah suggest uh using the whether it's maybe loneliness or boredom or whatever the emotion is that is uncomfortable not having the voice or not having look at it like look at that and kind of think about where that might be coming from that would be the vipassana so All right, before we get too far ahead, let's start getting to like the, the other side of this. So in the same way that the origin of form, sensation, perception, conditioning, and consciousness, in the same way that the origin, the samudya of those things wasn't exactly about where they quote come from in a physical way but a kind of psychological way let's notice what passing away means and what bhikkhus is the passing away of form 
What is the passing away of sensations? What is the passing away of perception? What is the passing away of samskara? What is the passing away of consciousness? Here, bhikkhus, one does not seek delight. One does not welcome. One does not remain holding. And what is it that one does not seek delight in? What doesn't one welcome? To what doesn't one remain holding? One does not seek delight in form, does not welcome it, does not remain holding it. As a consequence of this, delight in form ceases. With the cessation of delight comes the cessation of clinging. With the cessation of clinging, the cessation of existence. With the cessation of existence, the cessation of birth, with the cessation of birth, the cessation of old age and death. Such is the, and of course, sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure, and despair. So with all, such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. This bhikkhu is, is the passing away of form. This is the passing away of sensations, the passing away of perception, the passing away of samskara, conditioning, and that this is the passing away of consciousness. So with our remaining time, I kind of want to try to bring together a couple of the past Dharma talks that we've been talking about, and then what they just mentioned here. So what is the passing away of form, sensation, perception, conditioning, consciousness, right? Well, one does not seek delight, one does not welcome, and then one does not remain holding. Upadana, let's remember that, that's the key idea here, the grasping, clinging, appropriating, upadana. So, uh, no, no, this is not exactly nirvana. Uh, actually, I, let me, I'm going to write nirvana really big on my piece of paper. I will get to nirvana. So my intention tonight was to actually, I, I there's a few things that I want to try to make really clear, like super clear, super simple. So what does this mean? This idea of one does not remain holding form. One does not remain holding sensations. One does not remain holding perception. One does not remain holding conditioning. One does not remain holding consciousness. It, as far as I understand it, this is very simple. It's very difficult to do but it's very simple to understand. And what it is, is it's about, go back a half hour when I was going through the skandhas, form, sensation, conditioning, consciousness. Remember how I kept emphasizing that all five of the aggregates are constantly changing? They are constantly in a state of flux. What they're talking about though, is the, the tendency of the mind to basically be like, no, 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 I'm not done. I'm not done experiencing that sensation yet. No, 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 no. I'm not done experiencing that body of form yet. What's this new body of form doing here? No, 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 no. I'm not done with that perception. What's this new perception? This is about what the other sutra about the anxiety from clinging that Remember what that sutra told us, form changes, but the mind remains clinging to it and thus becomes agitated with suffering. But the point is, is that this aggregation of skandhas is constantly changing. I'm sorry, it's what's happening. But our mind has this tendency to basically stay either stuck in the past and holding on to our bodily form in the good old days. But even this idea of the good old days, 
the way that I used to look versus what is happening right here, right now. The sensations of being a youth. What happened to my, my youthful energy, right? What happened to the sensations of my youthful energy? I could remain clinging to that, and that would put me out of joint with what's happening right now. Same thing with perception, same thing with conditioning, same thing with consciousness, especially with states of consciousness, where the consciousness is always changing and where it's the mind is always like, can't I just go back to that? Can't or couldn't it be like that? Anything but this. <laughs> and that idea of clinging to the past or clinging to the future is causing anxiety. It's causing the dukkha. And so an analogy, I used to use this analogy a long time ago. I haven't used this analogy for a very long time, but it's a lot like jump rope or even better yet, like double dutch. If you're in sync with reality, meaning you're, you're with the current present state of the aggregates, you're going to be having a good time. If you're out of sync with the aggregates, you're going to get all tripped up in the ropes. You're, you're going to get tripped up in the jump rope and you're going to tumble and fall and all of that. And so it really is about being in tune with the present state of the aggregates, not clinging not holding on to the way they used to be, not hoping they will be a certain way in the future, but this sort of, and what I really want to emphasize is because the aggregates are always constantly changing, there's never anything there to grasp. It's, it's, a, it's a fool's errand. It's, it's utterly foolish to even try to cling at the aggregates. We, we see this, we know this intuitively, but we see this with the, um, the, the attempt to stop aging. It's like one of the classic examples of dukkha is this idea of like, how can I stop this? from happening is is there a pill i can take is there some makeup i could wear is there something i could do to stop this and i want you to think about the anxiety and stress that comes from that very idea of trying to stop the aging process versus the utter peacefulness of going with it in that way not trying to stop it, but actually being very comfortable with the current present state of the aggregates in that sense. I want to really stress that all of this that I'm saying is food for thought, something to think about. And what I mean is, when it comes to things like the the, the idea of suffering and what's causing suffering, I just mentioned this idea that trying to stop the inevitable aging process is, is, is a friction. It's kind of a friction with the way things really are. And we want to think about that. And I just mean, again, look at it and notice it and think about it. That's all in that sense. So... Questions, comments, we have a little bit more to say, but questions, comments, answers, ideas about this idea of, of the not clinging to the aggregates. All right, then I will mention, or I will address, um, so uh, Noe had asked about the idea of nirvana. So what we need to understand, or what, how I would, how I would think of this, so the 
we are being kind of um uh, and we are being advised by the Buddha to not seek delight in, not welcome, and not remain holding the aggregates, right? Now, the way that you can think about this is, let's say, let's say I was doing the thing where I was clinging to a former body of form. So again, like the idea of my youthful appearance. So let's say I was holding on to that as, as ideal. If I'm holding on to my youthful appearance as the ideal, then I'm obviously going to have negative thoughts about this. So here I am clinging to ideas of the way I used to look, and that's causing this anxiety, this dukkha around the way I currently look, because I'm comparing and saying, this isn't that, this sucks. So there's the dukkha, right? But I read the sutra, and I understand what the Buddha is talking about, and I say, you know what? I should. I should do a meditation retreat. I should go into seclusion and I'm going to think about all of this. So you go into seclusion, go into retreat and you notice that your mind is clinging to the past in that way. Or you maybe notice your mind's clinging to the future. And so through meditation, through calming down, let's say you stopped doing that. And let's say you stopped worrying and clinging to the future in that way. And then you sank into a meditative state that was observing, clearly observing the present state of the five aggregates as they presently are not the way they used to be, not the way they could be, but the way they presently are. And then in that meditative state of observing the skandhas as they are, you, you realize, you see them as such, as they are. And what I mean by that, let's again, let's not get carried away. We want to remember, oh, right, the five aggregates are constantly changing. They are never the same, ever, ever, ever. And so to observe the arising and ceasing of the aggregates is to be observing the aggregates at any given moment as they are in that moment. But my point is, is that what you will notice is, is that they are never the same in any given moment. And this is what I meant, mentioned earlier. The insight, the vipassana, is this kind of realization of, the only analogy that comes to mind is the flowing river. The river that, as Heraclitus tells us, the river that is never the same river twice. To see the aggregates as a flowing river, that would be closer to seeing the aggregates as such, as so. But what I really am trying to push us towards is an understanding that to really see the stream to really see the river flow of the aggregates as this kind of utter, constant, changing, unfolding flux, it is to realize that there is no me there. There is just the river flow of the aggregates. And basically what I was trying to get around to is that through this careful observation of the aggregates, not clinging to the aggregates past and future, and then observing the constant flux of the aggregates, you can move into a samadhi. 
the dissolution of that sense of self by observing just the current flowy state of the aggregates that has no past because this current aggregation of the of the skandhas has never been before this has never happened before so this has no past in that way so that is sort of how i would sort of try to wrap this all around to the title or the idea of samadhi so develop samadhi a bhikkhu one who is in samadhi understands things as they really are not the delusional way they used to be not the delusional way they could be but as they are in that sense and then that brings us back to the beginning of the sutra but that idea of to see the aggregates as they really are questions comments answers ideas about any of that <laughs> the irony maria indeed it is funny how the stressing about old age and death causes the illnesses of old age and death i oh my gosh yes yeah it's why all those enlightened monks and nuns look so youthful in that way gotta tell you <laughs> all right noe please I, so, oh, I still didn't get to nirvana. So sorry. Exactly. It's just so the samadhi in, in that realization, you know, which is constantly flowing in the flow. There's just that moment that it, it, it's always changing. It never stays. Nothing is. Yeah. Boom. You know. Is and there, there it is for me. At you know. Oh, 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 well, that was pleasant. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. The, the continuation of seeing this 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 these aggregates and when I come to you know there and then there's that moment of just oh huh. feel okay. good I don't need you know it's it's, it's just it's such it's the suchness of it and I and I feel and the suchness of it is is more and more constant the more and more I pay attention to this moment. Excellent. Let me finish up that thought about Nirvana real quick. So I started with a whole narrative. I started with this whole story. So let's say I'm clinging to my youthful appearance and it's causing me anxiety. So I go into seclusion and I get into a samadhi where I'm observing clearly this flow of skandhas and there is no self observing the flow. There is just the flow. But then the retreat's over. And I go back into the world and I start fantasizing again about the way I could be in the future, about the way I was in the past. So they're back. The suffering's back. The afflictions are back. But I go back into retreat. And I can get back to that clear seeing of the aggregates. I can get back to that place easier, more facilely for having been there already. And then the idea is through repeated exposures to the flow state of the skandhas, one can eventually eradicate that clinging mind altogether and meaning that it never comes back online when that clinging mind doesn't come back online anymore that's nirvana to always be observant of the flow state of the skandhas in that sense is to be in nirvana, to be a, basically effectively an arahat, at least in the early Buddhist tradition, to have that delusional sense of self completely blown out. 
not temporarily blown out in a deep meditation. That's the idea of the practice of, of the, the cultivating. But the idea of doing the cultivation is that we basically, frankly, we decondition ourselves or recondition ourselves towards enlightenment versus being conditioned towards delusion and ignorance. That's another way to think about it. But that's the general idea of Nirvana Noe is that it's when the afflictions and the delusions are permanently eradicated, not just temporarily during a nice meditation in that way. Yeah, Noe. There we go. Sorry. And that's right now. It could be. Good. Because it, 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 it sounds like it's something I'm striving for. It's something I'm just, I'm thirsting for. I, you know, it, it presented in, in, in a view like that. It's like, oh, someday. Mm -hmm. Unless I can practice and have the realization. It's suchness. It's just because it, 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 yeah. So <laughs> it's 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 turbulent right now. <laughs> Indeed. All right. Um, I do because I I was going to mention this earlier. So interestingly, as you know, we often um. We often are looking, and I even, you know, I, I did a little bit of Chinese tonight, but we're also, you know, all of these sutras, the old suttas, they have Chinese versions as well. And interestingly, in Chinese, this is not called the Samadhi Sutra. In Chinese, this sutra is actually about, it's called the Arising and Ceasing Sutra. So, and indeed, it is, it is very much about arising and ceasing, so that's good. But I want to make something clear, or I want to try to make something clear. I want to remind everybody that in Dharma Doors, lately, we're reading these old Pali suttas, the old texts, right? And I want to remind everybody that in the original form of Buddhism, represented by this sutra, the five aggregates arose and ceased. They accumulated, they came together, and they also went apart, like the sutra is telling us. But you kind of need to know something, and that is, what makes the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, and that's of course, all of later Buddhism, including Tibetan Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, all these other forms of Buddhism. Because all these other Mahayana forms of Buddhism, they are all founded on this fundamental teaching of emptiness. And the teaching of emptiness is articulated or is it is explained, especially in the famous Heart Sutra. The teaching of emptiness is explained in terms of the aggregates being empty and the aggregates not arising and ceasing. So Remember, the Bodhisattva Avilokiteshvara, while practicing the profound Pranyaparamita, clearly sees that the five aggregates are empty, thus overcoming all suffering. Shariputra, form is emptiness, emptiness is form, form is just emptiness, emptiness is just form, sensation, perception, conditioning, and consciousness are also like this. Shariputra, this is the emptiness of all dharmas. They neither arise nor cease, are neither defiled nor pure, and neither increase nor decrease. 
for this reason, within emptiness, there is no form, sensation, perception, conditioning, and consciousness. So that's the first good part of the Heart Sutra. The message of the Heart Sutra, the profound Mahayana message of the Heart Sutra, is that the aggregates don't arise and cease. And they don't arise and cease because they don't exist at all in any way, shape, or form. They are empty. There is nothing to arise. There is nothing to cease. To understand that is the express route to awakening. My point, though, is, is that we need to understand, or I would like all of you to understand, that in the Mahayana, they don't read a sutra like this because they don't look at the aggregates as arising and ceasing. So it kind of puts Mahayana Buddhism in a different, in a different relationship to the aggregates in that sense. So I just wanted to make that really clear that tonight we're talking about the arising and ceasing of the aggregates, but in the context of early Buddhism. If this was a Mahayana context, we would be talking about how the aggregates are empty. So, yeah, no. Ah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll save it for another time. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Yeah, and this is going to be an ongoing conversation, which is this sort of Mahayana versus the Hinayana, as it's called. Um, but I just wanted to point that out. Otherwise, unless there's any last questions, comments, answers, or ideas. Maria? Well, I just, um, I want to add that Thinking about um, these things as empty opens a whole like sort of world of contemplation for me. Thinking about like clinging itself as empty. Um, and I was looking a little bit at the sutra for the class coming up and thinking about, you know, desire as empty, that section. Yes. And then hatred as empty itself. So mm -hmm. things to think about. All right. Um, speaking of which, Maria was mentioning that I have a class coming up that I'm going to be teaching. It's a sutra study course. Uh, it's a six week sutra study class. It starts this Thursday. It's on Thursday nights, six to seven thirty, and we're going to be looking at a Mahayana Buddha sutra, as Maria was saying. That's also about samadhi, but from a Mahayana perspective, and it's all about emptiness and basically emptiness samadhis. So. If you want to join that course, you can go to my website, lotusunderground.com, find out more. Otherwise, that's going to do it. Thanks, Maria, for reminding me of that. All right, everybody. You want to say hi, Busto? Busto. That's my kitty. Ooh. Ooh. I don't oh. like 